America. Hello, I'm Zippy Duval, and I'm president of American Farm Bureau, but I'm also host of Farm, Farm Side Chat. And today I've got a great guest with me. Uh, you know, I've spent a lot of time traveling the country and, and, and talking to farmers and ranchers and people that are influencers around uh, agriculture, whether it be through policy making, whether it be through just social media. And this year, while we were at our national convention um, in Puerto Rico, I was excited to meet Zoe Kent, who is a farmer, eighth generation farmer in central Ohio. And uh, we're proud to have her as a guest today. She's an eighth generation farmer, and, and I'm just glad to have you with us, Zoe. And thank you for agreeing to, to join us on the Farmside Chat. Thank you for having me. Yeah. So Central Ohio, to give us a little bit uh, more of a bear in where that is. Yep, so I am in Crawford County. Um, it is one hour north of Columbus. Okay. A lot of people out there don't know this. I'm a Georgia boy, but I was born in Barberton, Ohio, on a, on a visit when my mother and dad went on a visit up there. Uh, and Didn't stay there but about six weeks and ended up coming back and was raised here in Georgia uh, at, at the, the home place here on the farm. So tell me about eighth generation. That. You know, you don't run into many eighth generation farms. So tell us what you think the secret was to sustainability in that farm that's been there for so long. Yeah, well, um, I like to say that we moved to Ohio and then we literally never left. Um, so eight generations ago, um, someone came to Bucyrus and they actually helped found the city. So um, we, we like to call ourselves Bucyrus Royalty, which uh, doesn't mean much in a very small town. Um, but the farm has really changed uh, over the years. We've kind of, you know, there's been generations where the farm's grown. It's done different things. There's been generations where it's just held on for dear life. And it's kind of just rolling with the punches for years and years. Well, you know, my dad told me when I bought him out, he said, son, farming and dairying, because I was in dairy business, it's like a riding a roller coaster. He said, you just buckle up. Pull it up tight and hang on because you'll have good days and good years and bad days and and uh, bad years and you just got to be prepared for for the next slump or height in the, in the business and it sounds like that's what describes your eight generations there and it definitely has described my life here on the farm uh, for for now uh, for sixty something years I've been raised here on this uh, dairy farm and we don't dairy anymore but we do have four hundred beef cattle and raise a lot of chickens for for Pilgrim Pride and uh, continue to do that and very proud to be able to do that. So tell me, I understand you just bought your dad out this spring. Uh, tell us a little bit about how that uh, relationship was. Cause I get asked by a lot of young farmers, how, how can you get into farming? And of course, you and I were blessed to have families that was in the farming business. But tell us a little bit about what it was like uh, in the last couple of years working with your dad and getting to the point where you're you bought the business out and how has it gone since you've done that? Yep. So um, way back in high school, we started the planning process. Um, I knew I was going to go to college and get a four year degree and then I was going to come back and I worked for him for a few years and we really wanted to do it in stages um, just because my parents didn't want me to get full in, hate what I was doing. And then we have this big mess. Um, so I worked for my dad for two years, I believe. And then we formed an LLC where he was 51% owner and I was 49. And then we were planning on doing that for five years, um, but his health kind of took a, took a turn. And so we called it at year three. We figured it would be safest for everyone. Um, and so it's been a nice gradual change over time. Um, and so this is my second year being full-time owner. Um, however, my dad is my largest landlord. Um, so he still has some strings he can pull over me if he needs to. So um, where are you at in your season? I mean, are you buying seed? Are you working on equipment? Are you planting? Tell everybody where you're at. Now. I am hauling a lot of grain. And then JB, he is my hired hand. He is working in the shop. He's putting some updates onto our corn planter right now. And he's going to make sure all the equipment is ready to roll for spring. 
Well, it, you know, that that's, a, you know, I, as being an agriculture guy with animals, it's every day and, you know, you're out there doing pretty much the same things every day, but it seems to be a little different on row crop. You got seasons of different types of work and it might even look like you're not doing anything, but I'm sure you're inside the barn doing a lot. And, uh, and if it's not delivering seed, it's uh, purchasing the seed that you're going to plant next year. And so tell us a little bit about the challenges that you had around input cost and and for those of you who don't know what input is is what we buy to be able to grow a crop and what we have to spend to do that tell us a little bit about your experience there yes um inputs have been crazy um i i really try to keep up with what my cost of productions are and um i knock on wood that right now you know the price of corn and beans is is going to make it cash flow. Um, but if we have a drop there, things will be tight. Um, but I'm really trying not to focus on what the input costs are because they are what they are and I can't do anything to change them. Yeah, that's true. And we, we're working hard at American Farm Bureau to try to touch all those sensitive points that might make a difference in cost, but there, there are very few places that you can make a, a big difference in that. So, uh, uh, I know, and I want to swap, uh, change the discussion a little bit around uh, being an influencer. Tell us a little bit about uh, your uh, transition over to being so active on uh, on social media, and how did that come about, and what have you gotten out of it? Yep, um, and I'm, I'm not sure if I've actually influenced anyone to do anything. I'm just trying to show my story in ag, um, but uh, about a year and a half ago, uh, I have a friend who's on teacher TikTok, um, and he said, Zoe, I need you to get a thousand followers so that we can go live together and I can show my classroom farming. And I said, okay, I guess I can do that. And I just said, I was going to post every day until I couldn't think of anything to post about. And, uh, I just keep coming up with ideas, I guess. Um, but it's, it's been really cool. I've been able to connect with a lot of people in ag, um, being a woman in ag, I, I know they're out there. I finally found my people. They may be states away, um, but I have found a group of people like me. And it's it's been really fun to see how different practices change over the different regions and how everyone has just a little different way of doing things. What surprised you the most? Um, just on the posting aspects, people will critique everything. I've literally been critiqued on breathing wrong. So <laughs> people always have their opinions to share and sometimes they are helpful. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, how would you encourage others uh, folks in being involved with social media? Because it's really important for us to tell our story. Yes, I think it is very important and it helps build community too. When uh, sometimes farming can feel very isolating. Um, but I just encourage people to show their authentic, uh, versions of what's going on. Uh, yesterday we, we were just pulling the planter around the corner and the hitch decided to break. And it's like, well, I've never seen that before. And my hired hand threw it up on social media and everyone's like, yep, that's happened to me twice. And <laughs> you realize you're really not alone in some of these, these issues. Yeah. You wonder sometimes this is probably the only time this has ever happened. Well, it's not, it's happened somewhere else. If it can happen to a cow, I've seen it here. So I, mm -hmm. I feel sure about that. Well, Zoe, I know that Farm Bureau, American Farm Bureau sponsored along with the Center of Food Integrity, Costco, Tyson, and others to uh, to talk about an engagement that Gen Z farmers could be involved in and discover things from each other. Could you tell us a little bit more about that? Yes. Um, so it was an awesome uh, couple of days down in San Antonio, Texas. We went to Keen and Peeler's uh, Premium Beef and we checked out their operation from having the cattle herds to the processing to how they get themselves in stores. Um, and it, it was the, the full the full line. And then the second day we had a food cook off, which was um, interesting for me because I can make uh, oatmeal pretty much. Um, and so this was, it was, it was really nice because we had a day where the farmers, we, we had our strength and we could have these one-on-one -on -one conversations about our farms and we could explain the process a little bit deeper to these people that use our food and, uh, promote beef production to their audiences. And then the second day I would, I, 
I don't want to speak for the other farmers, but I think we were all out of our comfort zone. And it, it was really cool seeing the dynamic kind of shift because we were definitely the, the uh, teachers on the first day. And on the second day, we, we were definitely learning. Um, and it was really cool to connect individually with all of these people um, and give them a sense of of agriculture today, um, updated practices that people are using, how many details go into, you know, these cows have ear tags, they're, they're tracking how many times they go to a water, exactly what their food is. Um, they can predict what the marbling is going to look like before this, um, this beef has been butchered. Um, and so, so it was just a really cool opportunity to connect uh, one on one, I think also as farmers, we interact with each other often, but we don't really engage with outside groups um, as often as we could or should. Yeah, a lot of times we tend to flock to the people, flock together with the people that think the same way we do. Mm -hmm. And that's why what you do each and every day is important uh, for, with your uh, social media activity and your influencing. Social media is virtual and we get to see people all over the country, but in that experience, you were person to person with them. How valuable is that to put together what you do every day? Oh, it's just so valuable. Um, just, and, and social media is helpful. You're seeing the face, but you're not, you're not there. You're not interacting with the person. You're not having long winded conversations. You know, this was three days of hanging out with these people every single day. Um, and yes, we came from different aspects and different places all over the country. Uh, but there was definitely a lot of similarities there and, and some good bonds were formed. Well, that's good. And I, I know those bonds and those relationships will help you even do a better job of being an influencer, even though you think you might not have influenced somebody. <laughs> I'm sure you have. Uh, and we appreciate the time you put in it. Let's talk a little bit more about your farm. I know you say that you're uh, conventional till, no till, uh, a little uh, cover crops. Tell us how you decide where you use conventional, where you use no till, and why wouldn't you put cover crops on everything? <laughs> yep, uh, we're all for experimenting here. Um, you know, a, a lot of people are hard headed, and there's this is the way we've always done it, or they're jump fully into a new practice and go all in. Uh, we like to timidly try things. And with the cover crops, we, we have found things that we love about them. And then the last few years we've gotten slugs in some and we're like, Oh, I don't, I don't really know about this thing. Um, and it, yeah, so it's like, we just don't want to go all in with anything. Um, and we have some fields that the soil type, you know, ranges, we, we only farm in an eight mile radius, but you wouldn't believe the different kind of soil types in that eight mile radius. Yeah. And, you know, even those soil types, then you start talking about different methods of farming and how we are so different across this country regionally. Mm -hmm. And, you know, those soil types can be that different in eight mile. Just realize what it is two or three states away. You know, I, I hear sometimes uh, uh, the people that are more interested, uh, well, not more interested, the ones that focus their discussions around environment, because we, we do that every day, but that's where they really live all the time. And they wonder why we don't do cover crops that well. Well, they, they just don't work. I mean, you can put a cover crop out there in North Dakota, but it's not going to grow. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's no telling. It's probably sub zero degree weather today, you know. So there are, there are a lot of places it works, a lot of places it doesn't work. And that's why we have to have research and development going on so that we know what practices, new practices we can use and know what part of the country they're going to be valuable to us in. So, uh, a lot of people don't really understand that. So tell us some of the regular challenges that you face every day in, at your farm. Hmm. Well, just random things breaking. It just seems like whenever we have a project, oh, this will take an hour. And then it's like, oh, everything's broken. <laughs> uh, but I think I think everyone deals with that to some extent. Um, and, you know, it's just the day-to-day -day challenge of, okay, how do we prepare ourselves for the season? It's like, we, we think that we get everything ready to go. And then, oh, we didn't, we didn't think about this. We didn't think about that. So we're always trying to be really proactive here so that, you know, it's, it's not like, um, 
beef production where it's, you're doing it every day. It's like, I need this technology to work for 10 days straight and that's all I need. And sometimes those monitors don't, don't get with the program. So how does sustainability and crop protection tools and different methods of tillage, how does all that play in together on your farm? You know, a lot of people say, oh, you spray. I, I, I don't like you to spray. Tell them what happens if we don't spray it. Yes. Um, and so for me, I, I'm definitely guilty of we don't do our own spraying. And so I don't film it much because it's not my uh, my my rigs. And so people are not seeing that. But even when I'm just putting like 28 on, you know, any any form of nitrogen and they're like, well, well, what are you putting in there? And so I just try to come from uh, aspect of teaching people. Um, I know a lot of people get really defensive really quickly. Um, because it's, you know, it's personal. It's like, it feels attacking sometimes. Um, but I just try to explain in layman's terms and not to be condescending because, you know, this is my line of work. I should be an expert in it. I don't expect a consumer to be an expert in the different chemicals that we're using. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of times the, the uh, crop protection tools we use helps us be more sustainable and friendly to the environment because, a lot of times that if we didn't have that crop protection too, uh, we wouldn't, we, we would have to plow more mm -hmm. uh, and release carbon into the air. And a lot of people just don't understand that, that cycle uh, that we really work in and, and we focus on each and every day. And uh, I wish everybody could spend a little time out there understanding a uh, cycle around cows and how they harvest the grass, which makes it grow more, which could sequesters more carbon, you know, and, and how all that works together and makes it makes us more sustainable in the future. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, you're young, uh, really in the first year of full ownership of the farm. Uh, what are you excited about? I I am excited for a lot of things. Um, I see all this new technology coming down the line. Uh, we do not run the latest and greatest equipment. So I'm excited for in 20 years when I may have um, access to some of that new technology. Um, and I'm just choosing to be optimistic. There's a lot of things to be pessimistic about right now and, and thinking about the future and what things will be like down the road when I'm ready to retire. Um, but I'm just trying to focus on the positive. Um, and like, yes, nothing has, nothing's really changed day to day uh, from me taking ownership over the farm. Um, and I am, I'm just trying to keep a slow and steady trek forward because, you know, um, no one's ever put pressure on me to keep the farm going, but obviously I feel a uh, immense responsibility for making sure that this is something that is transferable to the next generation. Yeah. I was third generation dairyman and decide not to dairy anymore was a really, it was, it was a difficult decision because I didn't be, I didn't want to be the one that stopped the dairy from running. Mm -hmm which we still farm and we're still actively farming, uh, but we just don't dairy anymore. But that still was a struggle. And I know mentally how that really affects people. So what would you say to some young person that's listening that wants to be in part of agriculture? What would you say to encourage them? I would encourage them to go to their local farmer and ask them if they want help picking up rocks. I, I know in my area, I would just, we're always looking for some of that young, young chipper energy um, of the young folks, um, and and just put yourself out there, get involved. Um, there are lots and lots of opportunities. I know everyone's talking about labor shortages and stuff like that, and I think most people are willing to take on new help. I think they're fine with training people. Um, the time to get started is now. <laughs> Yeah. And, you know, I think most farmers are out there uh, looking for someone that they can develop a relationship with, a trust in, that can have a either a long time uh, position there to work or even, even, even to the point of maybe having a transition from one generation to another. And really and truly, I know we live in an age where everybody wants instant gratification, but it doesn't happen in agriculture and it takes a lot of hard work and trust building to get to that point and uh, would encourage all young people to think about that uh, and, and to be patient. I talked to a group of young farmers this weekend in Nebraska and I said, you know, patience builds character and character builds leaders. And that's what we need in our, our industry. We need 
good agricultural leaders. And Zoe, I can see it all in you, and I'm I'm excited about what what we'll see in you and far as far as not just being a farmer, uh, but being a leader in our industry as we move forward. So, if there's someone out there would like to join uh, uh, up with you and be able to follow you, how would they find you? Yep, I am at Farm with Zoe. Zoe is just spelled Z O E. Um, on all of the platforms, I post family friendly farming content. So this is safe to show your little kids. Um, I try to keep it pretty simple, pretty basic, pretty, pretty uplifted. Um, with that being said, I will show uh, the difficulties and the breakdowns and the things happening on our farm just uh, with the PG spin. <laughs> Thank you, Zoe. Thank you for being with me today. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Farmside Chat. Please be sure to subscribe so that you never miss an episode. And while you're at it, take a minute to rate and review the podcast. This helps us continue to bring you farm fresh content that everyone can enjoy. Until next time, thank you and God bless you.